Hi everyone, we're talking about the sorbitol or polyol pathway in this lesson. So we're going to talk about why we need it and also why it's important in disease as well. So the sorbitol or polyol pathway is a particular metabolic pathway that we use in particular places in the body. So generally speaking, glucose is normally taken up into cells and processed through pathways like glycolysis or the breakdown of glucose and glycogenesis, which would be a production of glycogen. But there's an alternative pathway for glucose, and that is the sorbitol or polyol pathway. So the sorbitol pathway begins with an enzyme known as aldose reductase. And aldose reductase uses NADPH, and NADPH becomes oxidized to NADP+. And in doing so, glucose is converted into something called sorbitol. And sorbitol is something we refer to as a sugar alcohol. And this particular pathway is going to be activated in particular states. So in order for this enzyme to become activated, we need a high concentration of glucose. So aldose reductase has a high Michaelis mentin constant or KM. And because it has a high KM, it has a low affinity for glucose. So you need a high concentration of glucose to activate this enzyme. So again, most of the time, glucose is going to be rooted into glycolysis or glycogenesis or some other pathways like the pentose phosphate pathway, for instance. But if there's high levels of glucose, we get activation of aldose reductase and a formation of sorbitol. Sorbitol will then undergo another enzymatic reaction with the enzyme sorbitol dehydrogenase. This reduces an NAD plus to an NADH and forms fructose. Now this particular pathway is important in particular parts of the body. Some of these include the liver, the ovaries, and the seminal vesicles of the testes, where it's important for the production of spermatocytes, and sperm also use fructose as an energy source. So those are some of the parts of the body where we actually need the sorbitol pathway. However, in other parts of the body where this pathway is not required, we can have issues, especially if we have high levels of glucose that activate aldose reductase. Because sorbitol has significant osmotic effects, it draws water to it. And some parts of the body don't have this particular enzyme, sorbitol dehydrogenase. So we can have a buildup of sorbitol leading to osmotic effects and other issues and damage to tissues. We're going to talk about that here in a moment. So again, if we have a cell, this is the cell membrane, this is outside of the cell or the extracellular environment, we can think of having blood here. Normally, glucose is brought up into the cell, it can be through glute transporters. And normally, glucose is going to be acted on by hexokinase or the related enzyme glucokinase. Glucokinase is going to be located in the liver in the pancreatic beta cells, where hexokinase is located in many other cell types. And this leads to phosphorylation of glucose into glucose 6-phosphates. So it traps the glucose into the cell for use in the glycolysis pathway or in other pathways. But in the case where we have high levels of glucose, these are almost always going to be related to diabetes. So insulin resistance, type 2 diabetes, if we have high levels of glucose, this is going to lead to an increased uptake of glucose into the cell. Now again, even if there's high levels of glucose in the cell, some of that glucose can still go through the glycolysis pathway, but the problem is that if there's a high level of glucose, it can lead to the activation of the aldose reductase enzyme, so the beginning of the sorbitol pathway. And in becoming activated, glucose can be converted into sorbitol. And again, we use 1-NADPH. And then that sorbitol, now in cells that actually have sorbitol dehydrogenase, that sorbitol can then be converted into fructose, generating an NADH. Now, something I also want to mention here is that aldose reductase not only can act on glucose, but it can also act on galactose. Galactose is a monosaccharide, and most of the time, people are going to ingest galactose in the disaccharide form of lactose. So lactose can be ingested and then can be broken down by the enzyme lactase into glucose and galactose. And then galactose can also undergo a similar process by aldose reductase into its corresponding sugar alcohol, galactitol. Now, most of the time, this is not going to be a problem unless we have high levels of galactose, which can then lead to high levels of galactitol. And we can see high levels of galactose from conditions like galactokinase deficiency. So deficiency of the enzyme galactokinase can lead to elevations in galactose. So galactokinase is going to be the first enzymatic step that processes galactose into galactose 1-phosphate and eventually can lead into the glycolysis pathway. So if we don't have that enzyme, galactose can build up, leading to an activation of 
aldosterectase and increases in galactitol. We can also see it with classic galactosemia as well. These are going to be genetic conditions we can often see the clinical findings in young infants when they first start drinking milk or consuming lactose. So that's an also important part of this sorbitol pathway. The problem again is that not all tissues in cells have sorbitol dehydrogenase enzyme. And that's going to lead us into the next slide where we talk about those tissues with low or absent sorbitol dehydrogenase. So we can remember the tissues that have low or absent sorbitol dehydrogenase enzyme, and these can be remembered by the mnemonic LARCS. So you can think of the bird LARCS. The A is going to be referred or thought about as aldose reductase. So these tissues only have aldose reductase and they don't have sorbitol dehydrogenase. So the first one re represented by L is the lens of the eye. So the lens of the eye doesn't have sorbitol dehydrogenase. So if we have high levels of glucose, it gets acted on by aldose reductase leading to the production of sorbitol, but the sorbitol doesn't have anywhere to go. It draws water to it, causes damage, and we can have cataracts. So this is the reason why we can have increased risk of having cataracts in type 2 diabetes. And we can also see this in those conditions we talked about before regarding galactose metabolism. So there can be infantile cataracts in young infants who have classic galactosemia, for instance. The R in LARCS stands for retina. So the retina of the eye itself also doesn't have sorbitol dehydrogenase or has very small amounts. So again, if we have that activation of aldose reductase, we can get a buildup of sorbitol. Sorbitol, again, through its osmotic effects can lead to damage to the retina, and this can lead to retinopathy. Again, this is something we can see in diabetes, and in diabetes, we would term this as diabetic retinopathy. The K stands for the kidneys. So kidneys also have very low or absent sorbitol dehydrogenase enzyme. So again, sorbitol builds up, leading to osmotic effects, damage to the kidneys, and nephropathy, or a reduced kidney function. This, again, would be termed as diabetic nephropathy in diabetes. And Schwann cells are a cell type that has low or absent sorbitol dehydrogenase as well. Schwann cells are going to be the cells that compose the myelin sheath of axons of neurons in the peripheral nervous system. So in the central nervous system, it's going to be oligodendrocytes that make up the myelin sheath. But in the peripheral nervous system, it's going to be made up by Schwann cells. So Schwann cells make up the myelin sheath. So the myelin sheath is this fatty coating over the axon that improves axonal transmission. So it improves neural transmission and improves the speed of transmission. And if we have damage to Schwann cells, so that sorbitol starts to build up in Schwann cells, we get damage to those Schwann cells, we can have neuropathy. Again, in most cases, it's going to be due to diabetes. So we refer to this most commonly in diabetic patients as diabetic neuropathy. So those are the highlights of the sorbitol pathway and some of the health consequences of the issue with having high levels of glucose leading to activation of aldose reductase in tissues that don't have the second enzyme sorbitol dehydrogenase. I hope you found this lesson helpful. If you did, please like and subscribe for more lessons like this one. And as always, thanks so much for watching. I hope to see you next time.